This conference will now be recorded. All right, good morning, folks. So we are going to be talking about microorganisms over the next few weeks. I think that you'll find this uh, subject matter very fascinating, and uh, I think that you'll be amazed with uh, just uh, the information that you'll learn uh, as a result of uh, delving more into the subject matter of uh, microbiology and looking at the study of uh, microorganisms and uh, these different types of uh, uh, bacteria. And we'll be looking at viruses and we'll be looking at fungi and we'll be looking at different uh, microbes and such and going over this information. And I think you'll, you'll absolutely learn uh, some very interesting data and information. And really, I, I, it just never ceases to amaze me that although we cannot see <laughs> these organisms, yet the impact that they play on, upon our lives. It's quite remarkable. You see here, so I've seen uh, different um, numbers thrown around and such and uh, regarding the uh, relationship and the numbers uh, in comparison to human cells and microbial cells and our microbiome. So this is really the term that we use. They used to call it the flora, right? The micro, microbial flora. Uh, we now call it the more of the microbiome as a more proper term when we're discussing the microorganisms that live on and inside of us, right? You'll see here, as far as the human body's makeup, more than half of the cells in the human body belong to microorganisms that influence mood, weight, food cravings, and metabolism. That's amazing. To me, that's just amazing. And, realize, and realizing that also that it really, the situation here, as far as uh, mentioning about mood and such, how that also plays a part in how our cognitive abilities and how we think and, and how we behave and act and such can be affected by these microorganisms that live within our gut in particular. And so we can, uh, we can talk about that also. Let's uh, show you some more interesting pictures here. So this would be another image that I pulled up online. And so you'll see here, so they'll say, 90% uh, of all disease can be raced, uh, traced, see, traced, traced in some way back to the gut and the health of the microbiome. And so having a healthy microbiome within us, you, you, we all see uh, advertised in the in advertisements in grocery stores, um, them wanting to buy, a, recommending that we buy uh, yogurts, that we buy um, kefir, uh, we die, so that's more of like a liquid type of a yogurt, probiotics, um, prebiotics, all of these things that are talking about and uh, addressing the microorganisms that live within us and how having a healthy microbiome can make such an impact in our lives. I'll post these images for you all. Um, yeah, you'll see here, this talks about, and this is the one I hear a lot of, but really more of the, uh, uh, the other percentage there is more of a newer data, but there are 10 times as many microorganisms uh, as there are human cells in the body. See, that's, that's a little bit of an outdated estimate and uh, discussion as far as number-wise are concerned. More, it's along the lines of, uh, like a uh, the ratio that we showed you earlier there. Uh, let's see here. The 100 to 1, the genes in our microbiome outnumber the genes in our genome by about 100 to 1. Um, yeah, so just uh, let me minimize this. Let's go to another image here. That's this one. This is cool. All right, so this is just, this is showing you regarding, let me make it a little bit smaller. Okay, so fecal transplant therapy. And realizing that this is a real thing, and it really does make a difference in people's lives, and it really does make a dramatic difference in people's lives who end up suffering with different types of infections, in particular C. diff infection, where uh, Clostridium difficile infection, where it can be um, uh, such an infection that can create all kinds of havoc within the digestive tract, in addition to uh, chronic diarrhea and pain and discomfort gas and bloating, it's just a, a horrible illness that, you know, you'd say, well, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that their quality of life for someone who suffers with that uh, can be uh, terrible, okay? Um, what will happen is you'll see here, the happy good bacteria, these are bacilli, <laughs> or maybe like uh, the comma is a little bit of a different type uh, shape, but similar to the uh, uh, rod-shaped bacteria, stool from a healthy donor, it's processed and either it's in a liquid form or a pill form and the liquid form would actually be introduced into uh, the uh, GI tract of an unhealthy, the, the patient, the unhealthy patient and uh, via uh, doing a colonoscopy and such and having the, 
So here, if we're looking at the patient, right, and we're looking at the stomach, the duodenum, and then we have here jejunum, and ileum, the ascending colon, the cecum, the ascending colon, transverse and descending colon. We have here the sigmoid colon and the rectum. You'll see here like that the, the colonoscopy would introduce it into the descending and up into the transverse region of the colon, okay, in order to make sure that uh, it will populate the colon with healthy bacteria. So just something to look into. Um, we're going to be you're going to be doing a, uh, um, a paper for me, so we'll we'll discuss that uh, over the next uh, class there uh, on uh, Wednesday, uh, discussing as far as topics that you would like to do as far as on microorganisms and microbiology. Let's see here. And oh, there was one more. Yeah, so like I said, I'll post these for you. I think you'll just find it interesting and just seeing here as far as the different types of species. So a 600 plus species in the mouth, pharynx, which would be your throat and the respiratory system, uh, 25 species in the stomach, 1,000 species in the skin or on the skin, um, 500 to 1,000 species in the intestines, and 60 species in the urogenital tract. So uh, pretty wild stuff, folks. So I'm going to minimize that. And like I said, I'll share those with you um, over the next day or so. Okay. But let's get into our PowerPoint here. And I have posted this slide because it discusses, your first slide here was uh, talking about Escherichia coli. So I'm just, I posted this image for you just here now, just so that you can see these are uh, gram negative uh, rod shaped bacteria, right? And so pretty interesting how they look. Microorganisms, very tiny. Um, I'll show you here as far as, yeah, there we go. So in a couple of slides here, we'll discuss as far as size of these microbes, okay? So bacterium Escherichia coli or E. coli. Now you'll see here that when we're um, labeling and naming, uh, as far as nomenclature is concerned, um, if it's if you're writing it out and printing it, you have to underline the microbe. Or if you are using the computer, right, you would actually so the first word, the genus, would be uh, capitalized, and then the second word would be not would be lowercase, okay, so uppercase and lowercase. And again, if it's it would be also uh, italics, italics, put it in italics. Okay, and this would differentiate that this is a microorganism and this is how we're naming it, okay? Uh, let's see here, as far as, you'll see here that uh, prokaryotes, smallest microorganisms, smallest organisms in the world, um, their collective biomass, meaning their whole, so when we're thinking of these microorganisms, we're not just thinking of this, the little tiny structure, but the populations, the biomass of these uh, microbes, okay? Maybe greater than that of all the plants. That's Quite remarkable. You'll see here as far as on the human body, so the skin, the mouth, well, we just showed you this in that image, nasal passages, the lar large intestine, uh, the vagina, the urinary tract of both male and female, okay, um, as far as the distal portions of. Uh, so these uh, microorganisms do have a symbiotic relationship with us. They have this healthy relationship with us and they prevent us from having interaction with uh, microorganisms that could possibly be pathogenic, make us sick. Okay. So by them living on us and within us, they help us to do many functions and such and, and processes. And, and again, um, because they live on us, by them inhabiting areas of our body, they're preventing other pathogenic organisms from living in the same space, which could make us sick. So uh, very important microorganism or microbiome. So you'll see here as far as prokaryotes are concerned. So we've we last chapter, last couple chapters, we've been talking about and mentioning prokaryote, eukaryote, and such. So prokaryotes, right, um, into two of the three domains. So archaea, which would be the ancient and extreme type microorganisms, and bacteria. Okay, so these are prokaryotic, and the eukaryote, eukarya, eukaryotes. Uh, these are uh, the type of cells that are present within us. And what again, the differences between, we'll talk about in just one moment. But uh, you'll see here that. Um, Bacteria, microorganisms, many types are responsible for diseases. They're pathogenic, we would say. Okay? Um, the archaea live under conditions so extreme. So that's why I said they're, they're really extreme type organisms. And, and so you'll see here as far as these uh, prokaryotes, these archaea, you can have terms that we'll say as far as um, those that live in a high um, salty environment, high salinity, halophiles. Those that live in a very acidic environment, 
acidophiles, those that live in very uh, high temperatures and such, thermophiles, okay? Uh, extremes actually, so it could be very high or very low temp, right? Um, but living in extreme environments, archaea. Bacteria, um, again, these are the two of the three uh, domains that we've discussed and we were talking about uh, nomenclature and such uh, two chapters ago. So the importance of these uh, prokaryotic or organisms, right? Wide range of metabolic activities, right? Recycling of the elements of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. So quite remarkable how um, really the human body, as well as the world, will do all that it can as far as the organisms that live within uh, to recycle um, products that we're actually taking in. So the nutrients that we take into our body, uh, the body will do all it can to, to uh, recycle those and, and really take the cells that are present within and those that are dying or those that are weak and they're not performing their functions to recycle a lot of what the elements that are comprised of and then, yeah, get rid of and uh, as a result of uh, waste management uh, via the uh, liquid or the solid waste, relieve those out of the body, but still recycle quite a bit of the, uh, the nutrients and the uh, micro, uh, the organic molecules and such. Let's see here. So you'll see here as far as uh, we use these prokaryotes for certain foods and pharmaceutical products, a bioremediation, chemical reactions in industry. So here I've listed for you all. So I, I, I take these uh, PowerPoints and I always add information to them. So as far as production of bread, cheese, yogurt, wine, beer, fermentation processes and such, removal of pesticides from contaminated groundwater, quite interesting, cleanup of oil spills. Know that a good portion within a year, a good high percentage, I'm going to say in the 90 percentile of whatever has been spilled into the ocean can be processed by microorganisms. Yeah, that's, that's quite remarkable to be honest. I mean, you've seen some of these different um, oil spills over the years, and it's just terrible how the impact that it has on the environment, and know that we can add microbes to this these uh, different disaster areas of these oil spills and process, it takes a while, right, a year. And, and what's sad also is that to see um, different wildlife that are uh, that are covered in the oil, and oh, it's just, it's very sad, very sad indeed, but to know that, uh, these microorganisms can help us to take care of um, the different accidents and the foolishness of man, unfortunately, right? Um, mankind, right? So you'll see here as far as uh, size of the microbes. I wanted to give this to you. So I hope this gives you a little bit more of a perspective as far as how small and tiny these organisms are. So one to two microns. A micron is one millionth of a meter. So a meter, approximately three feet. You're thinking of just uh, size and such. So one millionth of a meter. Amazing. So here's this will give you another example as far as understanding that a human hair, right, approximately 90 microns. So 90 microns would be the diameter of one hair on your head. Okay. Um, so thinking that they are one to two microns as far as these microorganisms are concerned, really, really tiny, very small. And this is cool. And you'll see here that I believe it's, um, I wrote this down, is it like two of the 200 of these little uh, bacterium? can fit on the, the head of a, of a pin. It's crazy stuff, folks. Very, very small. So you see here, prokaryotes. So how do we, how do we identify it? And we've, we've discussed this, I've mentioned this to you uh, multiple times, but knowing that prokaryotes, no membrane-bound nucleus, right? So there's no membrane-bound nucleus or membrane uh, membranous organelles present, okay? Uh, their DNA and some of the proteins are located in the cytoplasm, a lot of diversity, I want to show you here as far as let's here we go i'll come back but i wanted to just show you and just remind you all that this is a eukaryotic cell a eukaryotic cell and what you're viewing here folks is that we see the nucleus and this nuclear membrane okay nucleolus present within the nuclear nucleus and the nuclear membrane and the genetic material that are present within here and the areas where ribosomes which are involved in production of protein uh, protein synthesis protein synthesis, which will then go to these membranous structures called the endoplasmic reticulum, which is the rough ER, because you can see these little ribosomes attached. Okay? Um, we also have this Golgi apparatus. We have here these mitochondria. Okay? Um, the smooth ER are also located here. And so you're seeing here that there's there are many structures within a eukaryotic cell 
um, that are membrane bound. And we'll see here also that, look at this, this is the plasma membrane. This would be the, the, the cell membrane, aka the plasma membrane, which keeps all the material present within the cytoplasm and all the organelles and the nucleus and such bound by this membrane here, okay? All right, so again, prokaryotes, very important to remember, no membrane bound nucleus or organelles. You'll see here as far as, um, just reiterating it here and showing you that uh, the genetic material is localized to a non-membrane enclosed area. And we'll, we'll talk about that structure, that nucle nucleoid area in a moment here. So even though we're not having a nucleus present for a prokaryotic cell, there's still a region within the cytoplasm of the prokaryote that contains, we would call it the nucleoid area that contains the genetic material. Okay. Um, you'll see here that as well as the, the uh, eukaryotic cells, prokaryotic cells have a cytoskeleton, which acts as if it's analogous to the skeleton of the body of a human, right? It's the, it gives structure to and allows for shape of the actual prokaryotic cell. And uh, most can use a variety of substances as energy and carbon sources, which is uh, allowing for the quite the, the large amount of diversity present within uh, these little microbe uh, microorganisms. So as far as the, we would use the term Morphology, okay, morphology. What's going on as far as the shape of these microorganisms? So three shapes are common, but there are there are many different types, okay? But just know that in particular, these common shapes, again, we're taking uh, microbiology and giving you a couple, you know, a couple of weeks of, of input, um, but, you know, to, to actually take the microbiology course, fascinating, fascinating class. And uh, to be able to uh, actually culture microorganisms and uh, do different tests. Uh, it's a really interesting class. It really is. And, and I'm sorry that we have not, we will not have the chance with this class uh, to be on campus to do any type of experimentation, but we'll still do, uh, we'll still do s some research and such. And so you will learn uh, quite a bit of information regarding uh, microorganisms. You'll see here, as far as the coxie is concerned, um, these would be uh, spherical in shape. The cylindrical or rod shaped would be the bacilli. Uh, spirilla, all right, would be the corkshoe, corkscrew uh, shaped. We'll show you examples of vibrio for a comma shape. That's what I was looking at as far as uh, the vibrio was concerned for uh, the microorganisms we we looked at earlier there. Um, so you'll see here uh, that these different I put in. Uh, and actually, this is wrong. No, all right. So whenever you have this would be capital mistake. So you can correct that. The strep throat would be an example of a coxie, right? Um, B serious or bacillus serious would be for bacilli. Again, you'll see here as far as for so strep throat, you, you have totally an understanding regarding that can uh, be an infection that can cause a lot of uh, discomfort uh, and issues with the, your pharynx, your throat. Uh, B serious for food poisoning. Uh, Campylobacter uh, jejuni for childhood diarrhea. So it really affects more of a, a um, we would say, uh, not as mature, so immature, uh, immature immune system in comparison to an adult immune system. That's a better way to put it. But so childhood diarrhea, Campylobacter jejuni, and uh, comma comma shape for the vibrio, vibrio cholera, and cholera is uh, quite a uh, terrible illness, folks. And there's just basic um, hygiene skills that can be taught and that can be put into practice that can prevent the spread of cholera, okay? And a healthy, uh, a healthy water source, very important, okay? Um, you'll see here as far as uh, the presentation of these different types of shapes of microorganisms, they can be in a pair, so we would use the term diplo, strepto for a chain, staphylo for a, a group or bunching, and it, literally it means a bunch of grapes, right? The translation there. And so we can look at Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, and we can see them in different presentations, aggregates of the cells. Here you're seeing an example of Spirilla, uh, Bacilli, of the Coxie. 
we talked about this eukaryotic cell. Okay. The cellular components. So most prokaryotes, single circular prokaryotic chromosome, right? This genetic material for the cell to reproduce, packed into a central area called the nucleoid. I mentioned that term earlier. So the nucleoid is important. Now know that um, in addition to the nucleoid area, there are these small circles of DNA that are in distributed throughout the cytoplasm and they are called plasmids. So this is a eukaryotic cell. And just know that this area right here is all called the cytoplasm, right? The guts of the cell, I like to say, right? It's just a really professional term, but when you think about it, you're like, yeah, well, that's what it is. It's the everything that's inside of the cell wrapped around by the cell membrane, aka the plasma membrane, which is a phospholipid bilayer, it's a fat, uh, which includes many carbohydrates and proteins uh, present for channels and such, and carbohydrates for stability. Um, this is this is what's going on with the cell that we have, whether it's prokaryotic or eukaryotic, it has a membrane. It has this covering and then everything else is within and it's selectively permeable, allowing material to go in and to go out, but being selective about that. So you see here, as far as the genetic material is concerned, the nucleoid would be this, this area, the central area where the majority of the DNA, the, the chromosomes are located. And then you'll have here small circles of the DNA would be the cytoplasm distributed throughout would be called plasmids. They have small ribosomes, right? Differ from the ribosomes of the archaea and structure and function, um, but still present for protein synthesis. And the cytoplasm, and know that ribosomes, whether it's in a prokaryotic cell or a eukaryotic cell, ribosomes do not have a membrane. They're not considered a membrane-bound organelle. And then the cytoplasm can contain these storage granules, right? And these would allow for holding of uh, different uh, molecules and such as far as glycogen, lipids, phosphates, and other types of uh, uh, molecules needed for cell function. Now, what we'll see here is that uh, the cell wall, the capsule, uh, different in these microorganisms in comparison to a eukaryotic cell, okay? So, whereas we would say the eukaryotic cell <clears throat> Here. When we're looking at a eukaryotic cell, and you've seen this image many, many times, and just seeing here that the camera's bigger. Okay, make this bigger for us all. All right, so as we look at this section of the plasma membrane, right? So outside of the cell, extracellular, inside of the cell, intracellular, containing the cytoplasm and the organelles and such. Again, eukaryotic cell. We have here these proteins. We have here these phospholipid, right? We have the one phospholipid here, one phospholipid here. The tails are hydrophobic, so they, they are oriented to themselves. And then the hydrophilic heads, are exposed to the extracellular fluid, the intracellular fluid. And you'll see here that there are carbohydrates, there are other uh, proteins and such present, as well as a glycolipid, uh, glycoproteins, in addition to these proteins that allow for uh, material to pass through uh, either way and selectively permeable. Now let's take a look at, coming back here to, now we're thinking of as far as microorganisms are concerned, much different as far as uh, the primary structural molecule of bacterial cell walls is the peptidoglycan. Okay? This is a part of the structure that will um, really protect the inner contents of uh, the microorganism and you'll see there it's a major component of uh, what goes on as far as um, the plasma membrane or the, the membrane of the uh, the microorganism you see here, it's a peptidoglycan. So think about it for a moment here. So you're thinking of uh, you're thinking of amino acids, proteins, and you're thinking of carbohydrates, sugars, right? So peptidoglycan, and we're going to see that the presentation, depending upon whether um, the different types of gram staining that we do in order to determine uh, the type of cell wall and what encompasses the microorganism, is going to depend upon where and how thick the peptidoglycan is in, compare, in addition to 
they also have a plasma membrane. It's a different type of presentation than the eukaryotic cells. So you'll see here, I mentioned this, this stain technique, this gram staining technique. And you'll see here that gram positive, gram negative. Gram positive stains purple, gram negative stains pink. Um, you'll see here that they are different presentations of the cell wall and the components of the structures that will keep the cytoplasm within the uh, prokaryotic cell. Okay, you see here, bacteria have cell walls consisting of a thick peptidoglycan layer, okay? Gram positive, again, they stain purple. Gram negative, bacteria will have cell walls consisting of thin peptidoglycan layer, right? Surrounded by an outer membrane containing lipopolysaccharides, okay? So let's show you some images regarding, first I'll show you just the staining, what goes on here. So we use some different dyes as far as uh, the dye crystal violet. Um, we also use this iodine, which is what's called a fixer, it fixes uh, the stain to the microbes. Then we use an alcohol wash, right? And we're doing this folks in, in the microbiology lab. And, and I, again, I wish I had the opportunity to allow you to do this in the lab this semester. It's not gonna, it won't happen, but, but you can at least view and we can watch some video and I'm gonna ask you to actually part of one of your presentations and work for me to watch a video regarding gram staining and you list for me what goes on as far as what's taking place with gram staining. You'll see here as far as also then, um, once the color wash, right, with this alcohol wash is performed, you'll see that certain bacteria still contain, right, the coloration, the, the dye from the crystal violet. Um, and so these would be gram positive, you'll see here their cocci, and then the gram negative represented here would be then the ones that are, the, the stain has been removed, crystal violet, and then as a result of the alcohol wash, but, and because of the presentation of the cell wall, but in the case of the safranin, they will then take on the safranin. These are then considered gram negative. Okay, gram negative. And here you're seeing as far as gram negative, kind of pink, and gram positive in the purple. Okay. And more than likely, these are like these are more in like uh, groupings and such. So like Staphylococcus, um, um, the the group. Oh, golly, why am I? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, the Staphylococci, right? And uh, you're not seeing really the uh, the strept at all. You're seeing more of a Staphylococcus because of the bunches of grapes, the, the groupings of the uh, microorganisms. And then you're seeing here as far as these uh, rod-shaped uh, psilli, uh, more than likely E. coli. Now, so most pathogenic bacteria are gram-negative staining. And what goes on with this uh, gram-negative stained type bacteria is that they can also, as a result of their outer membrane, protect them against the body's defense systems. And then really, so, uh, antibiotics can be really difficult as far as treating these gram-negative uh, stained bacteria, okay, or these gram-negative species of bacteria, okay. Um, now know that there's you now Streptococcus pneumoniae, right? What I, I, what's the color here? This would be purple, so this would be gram-positively stained, and so don't know that there are also gram-positive bacteria that can also make you very sick and are considered pathogenic, okay. And know know something else also that um, depending upon where these back microbes are located on your body, they, you can have a symbiotic relationship. So bacteria on my skin, on my integument, are fine there. I have a symbiotic relationship. They don't cause me any illness, any sickness, any infection. But if I get a cut and those bacteria that were on my skin enter inside of my body, that can cause an infection because they shouldn't be there. So location of the microorganisms um, is a big deal regarding they can be uh, good, have a good healthy relationship with us one place, but if you move them into another area, that could be a problem. So say, how about in the case of uh, urinary tract infections, particularly for females? So uh, because of the proximity of the uh, female urethra and the anus, there can be issues as far as if there's not uh, proper cleansing techniques, right? Um, we can end up having the E. coli and other bacteria that are healthy in the gut, in the digestive tract, but not healthy in the urinary tract and could cause a urinary tract infection. So very interesting as far as how even, even on our own body, on our own microbiome, 
bacteria that would normally not make us sick, if they're moved to other areas of our body, can make us sick, okay? So I've showed you here as far as then, uh, whether they're gram-negative or gram-positive, they can make us sick, but primarily the pathogenic bacteria are gram-negative. Um, bacterial cell walls can be coated with an external layer of this polysaccharides, these uh, glycocalyx, we call it. Um, the glycocalyx really is quite interesting in that um, this is outside of um, cells and not just bacterium, not just prokaryotes, but eukaryotes. And the glycocalyx allows for the immune system of whatever organism we're talking about. So we, I always refer back to the human microorganism, human organism, the human uh, body because of that's my field of study. And know that the glycocalyx on human cells, right? Um, allows our immune system to, to look at and to notate and to see that our cells are not um, outside cells. They are our own self. They're our own cells. And so we do not mount an immune response to our own cells. If we did, that would be an autoimmune type of disorder going on in our body that we're reacting in an immune response or responding in an immune response to those healthy cells within us. That's no good. But we take in bacteria and other type of cells and such that enter into our bodies and their glycocalyx, when our immune system is checking them out, right, will say that, hey, that's a non-self. That's not a cell that is uh, normally should be found within our body and will mount an immune response as a result of this interaction with the glycocalyx on the external layer of uh, uh, microorganism. There can, it can be uh, loosely associated or firmly attached as far as a, more of a slime layer or a capsule. Have you ever seen, um, grown any type of experiments in your, in your refrigerator by accident and, and you uh, open up something and you're like, whoa, not only does that stink really bad, but it also you can see that the, the bacterial growth that's present on there and the microbial growth that's present on there uh, can be pretty funky stuff. And uh, so you have all at one time or another seen a slime layer as a result of uh, uh, microorganisms growing on certain things that they should that, that if you were to eat would make you very sick. Here you're seeing as far as an example of this Streptococcus pneumoniae, again, um, you were looking at strep, so it's in a chain, right? You see the chain there, folks? See the chain? Okay. And so what you're seeing here is that, and uh, here we go, chain happens. Gold letter. Yeah, you're right. That's good, Christian. Yeah, good job. Yeah. Um, so you see here, this is a, a gram-positive uh, microbe that can make you sick. And you're seeing here, as far as with this example, you're seeing uh, the capsule, the outer portion, uh, the cell membrane, right? Uh, the cell wall. So it's it, there's multiple layers present here uh, that allow for protection of the uh, genetic material and what's inside of uh, this uh, microbe. So let's look at as far as gram positive and gram negative. Okay, and you'll see here that yeah, there's some difference there for sure. For sure, as far as uh, presentation is concerned. I've been talking for a while, and I'm sorry. I, I want to stop what I'm doing for a moment here. Um, yeah, thank you, Christian, for mentioning that regarding uh, slime layer happens with old uh, lettuce. That's good. Um, does anybody have any questions at all? I, sorry, I keep on talking, and I want to make sure that if there's any input, and it's okay to actually absolutely put a question up as far as in the chat box, and I do that does come up, and I do see that while I'm lecturing. Are we okay? All right, folks, good. Go back. Let me. Uh, Hide everyone, and then I'll. Uh, oh, difference between gram positive versus yeah, that's what. Thank you, Nathaniel. Very good. So that's what I'm going to uh, uh, go over with you all now. Yep. So very good. Good question. Yep. You'll see. You'll see here. Gram positive, gram negative, and so you're going to see as far as turn slide. Yeah. Here we go. So gram positive bacterium. So this cell wall, um, you're looking at this structure right here. Okay, so this is the cytoplasm. So this is inside of the cell. Here would be outside of the cell, the extracellular environment. Inside of the cell, represented by this gold here. Okay, so you're looking at the plasma membrane, and you're looking at that thick peptidoglycan layer. So one of the one of the key issues here is that there's a thick peptidoglycan layer for gram positive. Gram negative has a thin peptidoglycan layer. Right. So we've got here as far as the cell wall with that thick peptidoglycan layer. Right, we're thinking of amino acids and carbohydrates comprising this purple 
area here. And then we have a, a plasma membrane that you recognize. You recognize this for the eukaryotic cells, right? They are the um, polyphospholipid, as far as you'll see right here and right here. So it's a phospholipid bilayer and a thick peptidoglycan layer on the outside. Okay. So cell wall, plasma membrane, here's the inside of the cell. That's gram positive. Gram negative, now this one's a little bit different here, right? There's, there's quite a bit here as far as the gram negative. And you're seeing here as far as, so here again, the gold would be the cytoplasm inside of the cell. Then we have plasma membrane, pepido, a thin peptidoglycan layer, plasma membrane again. So we have here two, two membranous layers and then a capsule on the outside. So there's multiple layers here in comparison to the gram positive. And you can see how this can this can cause issues where it'd be more difficult for um, any type of uh, antibiotic to actually make a difference with the gram negative bacterium. Here you're just seeing here as far as this is a, another um, a bacilli, okay? And you're seeing here as far as the uh, capsule and here's the cell wall, okay? And here you're seeing like the, the nucleoid portion of the, uh, the cell, and then you're seeing here the different structures that make up the cytoplasm of this bacterium. Now we're gonna go over a couple other terms here as far as flagella, okay? And I saw, you can see flagella here. Here we go, okay. Yeah, so the flagella, this is a tail. This is this allows for locomotion. This allows for movement of the microorganism. Okay, we know as far as in uh, human anatomy, only the sperm contains a flagella. Okay, it contains a, a flagellum with the tail. You'll see here as far as look at how it, um, its presentation and its anatomical structure present within, attached to right the cell wall. And you'll see here as far as um, quite remarkable, folks, how uh, the structure of this flagellum is the complexity of it and allows for the locomotion. You'll see here as far as a, a counterclockwise movement of uh, rotation of this tail, allowing for then this movement of this uh, microbe. The pili, pili are smaller. They're not as large as a flagellum, right, as the tail. And they will uh, be rigid hair-like shafts of protein, right? the pili, extending again from the cell wall, as does a flagellum. Right? Um, among bacteria, pili are characteristic primarily of gram-negative bacterium. And you'll see here, as far as they allow for adherence to other cells, which is important. When, when you think about that uh, microorganisms, they're very tiny, right? And so really their impact is in, in their population size. Right, so the more, the greater the population of a microorganism, the more impact it can have on its host. Okay, and so knowing that adherence to other cells is very important, as well as allowing for, so like, like a tube allowing for transfer of genetic material, call it the sex pili. Right, and so you'll see here, this is an example of. So this is the pili are not present here to allow for movement, to but more to allow for. Uh, connection between uh, other bacterium as well as the transfer of uh, genetic material, which would be important because this can allow for mutation to, to occur and really to allow for uh, genetic traits for a microorganism to allow for it to survive and those to be passed on to other uh, microorganisms to go from generation to generation. Okay? And uh, this can be a problem as far as in uh, what takes place as far as the mutation of microorganisms and the allowing for um, antibiotic resistance and such. And we'll talk about that, not today, but we will talk about that. And here you're seeing a basic bacterial cell. And you're seeing here that we have pili represented. We have a flagellum represented, a tail for locomotion, for movement. <coughs> You'll see here as far as the nucleoid area, central regional, central area of the cytoplasm that contains the genetic material. There will also be plasmids present throughout. And um, you'll see here, this circular type of uh, gene genetic material, as well as just other ribosomes present, which allow for protein synthesis, right? Present in the cytoplasm. And then you'll see here, as far as just giving you the layer of and showing you the cell wall and such, okay? So 
equals death. Now, the next few slides here are uh, something that you need to uh, be able to uh, create some flashcards and start to get down as far as understanding a little bit and the differences between them, okay? As far as um, the diversity present within uh, the microorganisms, as far as how they take in materials and are able to uh, process materials in such a way in order to uh, survive and to carry on their species. Um, you'll see here as far as, uh, so all organisms take in carbon, okay? So all organisms take in energy, different sources and such. We'll come back to this in just a moment again. Um, I wanted to show you as far as the term, you see here an autotroph and a heterotroph. You've probably heard these terms before, I'm sure. Um, but just as just as a reminder, so I put this slide in here and just giving you a little bit more of a visual graphic to see that autotrophs, right, uh, making their own food. Heterotrophs do not make their own food, but must obtain energy from outside sources. So will we not be considered uh, heterotroph in that we, you know, like we as humans, we're not producing our own food, right? We have to get, we have to take in, ingest different nutrients and such, right? So you'll think autotrophs include plants, some protists and bacteria. Um, you'll see here heterotrophs, animals, fungi, bacteria, but uh, primarily autotrophic, but not necessarily for the microorganisms. So you'll see here then autotrophs obtain carbon from CO2, from carbon dioxide. Heterotrophs obtain carbon from organic molecules because what are you doing? Taking in, you're ingesting in organic molecules. And now understand this as far as microorganisms are concerned, what about what takes place in the soil as far as the breakdown of um, different organisms that die and their carcasses are left around throughout the dirt and such. And so there are microorganisms in addition to scavengers and such that will process uh, these dead organisms and such. So that would be considered organic molecules. So autotrophs, heterotrophs. Um, taking in energy, whether we take in chemical energy or whether we take in light energy, that's important to see there. So you see here, obtaining energy by oxidizing inorganic and organic substances, different types of chemicals and such that are processed, and then light nourishment, phototrophs. That's truly the, the, the definition, obtaining energy from light. And so where do we get energy from light? But from the sun. And we will be, after we're looking at this uh, unit here and such, we'll be looking at uh, plant life and such and talking about that in more greater detail. Chemoautotrophs, chemoheterotrophs, right? Photoautotrophs, photoheterotrophs, right? So you're seeing here that there are, and giving you examples of what takes place with the specific types of, so we've, we've already looked at as far as specific terms, autotroph and heterotroph, and then we add where they're getting their energy from, whether it's chemical or, or uh, light energy. So again, chemo, auto, chemohetero, photo, auto, photohetero. And you've got these, do not memorize this, please. But you can just, this can be helpful for you. Gives you a little bit more information because it's giving you even a little bit more of a uh, difference regarding um, adding to a little bit there more information. I'm not gonna ask that you give me this these information. I kept it there in the PowerPoint though. But this I do want you to know. So you need to know these terms. You need to review these terms. You need to know them for your test. Not this upcoming test, right? But the next test number two. Okay. And then the last uh, last couple slides here I'm going to go over with you all are regarding um, requirements for oxygen or non -re or requirements that that do or different processes that do not occur different organisms that do not require oxygen in order to live. So aerobic aerobes right require oxygen for cellular respiration for the different metabolic activities that take place within the cell um, of these. Um, different microorganisms, and I'm going to show you an image in just a moment. You saw it briefly there, but um, in the lab when we're in microbiology and we're determining through testing as far as whether an organism is an aerobe or an anaerobe or the different types that are kind of in between, um, we'll look at that as far as obligate and facultative um, and micro anaerobes. Um, we'll see that the requirement for oxygen or not really helps to separate uh, the different types of microorganisms. So you see here an obligate aerobe, right? Cannot live without oxygen, right? It's obligate aerobe. Obligate anaerobe, poisoned by oxygen, so they cannot live in an environment with oxygen. They survive either by fermentation or anaerobic respiration, right? 
no oxygen required. Facultative anaerobe use oxygen when it's present, but can live by fermentation and under anaerobic conditions. Now, this image that I've provided for you all, right? Pretty cool. It's showing you how we've done this test where we have these different types of bacteria that we can determine where the growth is present within the nutrient uh, broth that we see here as far as for this test. So in the case of obligate aerobes, right? Obligate, so they require oxygen. So what's gonna happen here? These lids are not, um, these lids would not be on tight, okay? There would be a looseness to the, to allow for oxygen to enter into the tube. So here where there's no liquid present, where there's no nutrient broth uh, would be oxygen. So what is gonna go on with an obligate aerobe? They're going to grow close to the surface near the oxygen. Does that make sense, All right? So now a facultative anaerobe for the next one here, both aerobic and anaerobic growth. So you'll see here, so aerobic and anaerobic growth. Because the further, the deeper we go into the nutrient broth, the less oxygen that would be present. Understood? So look over here. This would be the opposite of the obligate aerobe, would be the obligate anaerobe. And so if there's oxygen close to the surface, well, then there's no oxygen here. So that's where they would grow, as far away from the oxygen as possible. So obligate aerobe, close to the oxygen, obligate anaerobe, as far away from the oxygen as possible. Only anaerobic growth ceases in presence of oxygen. So here, there's not gonna be any growth of this bacterium. So in other words, you would, we would actually inoculate this broth with a bacterium, with a microorganism, and see where it grew. And that would then tell us as far as their requirement or non-requirement for oxygen would be, uh, you, you'd know. Because you can actually visually see the, the growth of the, so you're, you're gonna look at a tube, I don't know, it's about like six inches or so, and, um, and you'd have about two thirds of it filled with the, the broth. And then after you've inoculated the broth, then you would put it into a uh, incubator and you would allow it, in, it's at a certain heat, and you would give it a few days to grow. And then you would see what's taking place. So the facultative anaerobe, again, can grow in both an oxygen environment and a lack of oxygen environment. Aerotolerant anaerobes, right? Only anaerobic growth, but continues in the presence of oxygen. So you can see some is up here, but primarily it's more uh, deeper into the broth. And then this micro aerophile, so only aerobic growth, but it only requires a little bit of oxygen. So a low concentration of oxygen. So if we're looking at here, high concentration of oxygen, here would be a low concentration of oxygen, here would be no oxygen. So you'll need to know these terms also, please. And by looking at this image here, it really does help you to, to understand what's going on with that. Okay.